Okay, hi guys, it's Miss Duffy here. I am going to attempt to reteach some of the concepts of Unit 1 that you indicated to me uh, through the discussion question of what standards or concepts you would like me to reteach. So I'm going to plug through this PowerPoint and hopefully help you understand those concepts a little bit more. So here we go. Okay, let's start with types of maps. A so standard 1.1. I think this is the biggest confusion I am seeing as far as messages coming from you guys. So there's many, many different types of maps, yes. Um, but think of it, let's back way up and just there's two main types or categories of maps. All maps are either going to be a reference map or a thematic map. And all the other maps are going to fall into one of those two. So just, again, think about it as two major categories of maps, reference and thematic. Okay, the biggest way to remember the difference between the two is reference maps do not include data. There's no data on them. They're going to show locations of places and geographical features. Okay, um, an example of a reference map might be uh, the United States, and it's showing all the physical features, like where rivers and mountains are. Okay, that's reference maps. The other type of map is a thematic map. This does contain data. So anytime you're looking at a map that contains data, it's going to always be a thematic map. It has a theme, okay? So an example of a thematic map might be a map of the United States that's showing what states vote Republican and what states vote Democrat. That is showing data, so it's thematic. Okay, let's do some practice on some of these. So this map is showing per capita personal income in the United States. What kind of map do you think it is? A reference or thematic? It's thematic. It's got a theme and it's also showing data. Okay, how about this one? Is it reference or thematic? It is a map of Arkansas showing roads. It's showing cities. What do you think? It's a reference map. It is not showing data. Okay, how about this one, guys? Is it reference or thematic? It is showing all the locations of radio stations. It's thematic. The theme is radio stations. It's also showing us data. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball. There's different ways that you can show data. Okay, so what type of thematic map is this? How is it showing data? It's showing it through dots, right? So every dot is representing one radio station. So this is called a dot distribution map. You guys remember this? Okay, this one might be a little tricky. What do you think? Reference or thematic? It's showing Africa's vegetation. It's reference. Okay, yes, it is showing us the vegetation, but it's not giving us actual data about that vegetation. Okay, how is it showing these uh, different climates? Through color. So it's also a chloropleth map. Okay, let's try this one. Reference or thematic? It's showing obesity in the United States. It's thematic. Okay, but what type of thematic map? How is it showing the data? It's showing it in color, right? So it's going to be a chloropleth map. Does that make sense? Okay, how about this one? Thematic or reference? It's thematic. Okay, it's showing data. And how is it showing data? Anybody remember what this is called? This is a proportional symbol map. So the larger the skull, the more fatalities. Okay, let's do one more. Reference or thematic? Thematic. It's showing us where Walmarts, McDonald's, and Starbucks are across the United States. And how is it showing us the data? You guys remember this one? This is one of my favorites. 
How's it showing us the data? Through cartogram. So cartogram is where it distorts the size based on the amount of data. So for example, you can see there's more Starbucks on the west coast because it's bulging in size over there. But not only is this a cartogram, it's also showing us data in another way, in color as well. So the darker the colors, the more of those restaurants are there. So it's also a chloroplast. Hoping this makes sense to you guys. Okay, so I wanna take a quick minute here and just stop and make sure everybody understands that types of maps are not map projections. Those are two totally different things, okay? What we just went through are different types of maps. But remember, map projections are where you're attempting to replicate the three-dimensional model of the Earth on a flat surface, and there are distortions. Hoping to jar your memory a little bit here, we watched this in class, and it's a little video by Vox called All Maps Are Wrong. And if you want to watch that, I embedded it in here. I did put this slide in here that shows the different types of map projections. Remember, we talked about the Mercator is the one most common that's seen in classrooms. Here's another one of the Robinson and the Polar. Okay, just remember it, map projections are always showing the three-dimensional model on the Earth. It's of the Earth. It's just that they're really distorted and there's no map that is actually right in projections. Okay, moving on, you guys indicated you also were struggling with standard 1.3, the power of geographic data. Okay, so don't overthink this either. This is just how we use information that we get from people to make decisions. And a lot of that is where, where you, maybe the government wants to place things or if you wanna open a business where you wanna put that business. So um, a good example to start with this is I just got my census in the mail uh, last month and we have to fill that out. It's just basic questions of gender, how many kids are in the house, um, maybe even how much income we make. And that goes to the Census Bureau and they document all that information. And when they put all this information together, they can make big decisions um, based on what services are needed and where they're needed. OK, so, for example, if you want to open a business, you're going to look at like what your clientele is going to be around that area. If you're selling a certain product, um, then you want to make sure that people in that area want it. You can even take this to a personal the decision level of using geographic data. So let's say you want to move somewhere and you don't know anything about that area. You might get online and check out if the crime rate's high. Um, maybe if the schools are good. So this is it's just that simple. It's just using geographic data that is available to us to make decisions. Businesses can use this, governments can use this, organizations can use this, and you can use this for your own personal decision making. Okay, this is probably the biggest catch-all for the class. It's standard 1.4. And it's just spatial concepts and how we think spatially. So all these are no terms. Um, I'm not going to read those to you, but because we're going to go through them a little bit more detail with some examples here in the next couple of slides. But all these no terms, absolute relative location, patterns, flows, distance, decay, and time, space, compression, these are all ways we think spatially. So don't make it too complicated. OK, we think about a space and we have ideas about that space. And these are just different ways that we can read spatial concepts. All right, let's start with absolute and relative location. Again, these are two different ways we, we think spatially. OK, relative location is if, say, you're giving somebody directions to your house and you say it is across the street from the loaf and jug. That is relative location versus absolute location is you might give them your specific address or you could even give them, if you're really nerdy, your longitude and latitude coordinates to your house. Okay. Okay, another way you can think spatially is through patterns. Now, all those four level map analysis I made you do all year, that was for good reason. Okay, whether you realized it or not, when you were doing those, you were 
you were thinking spatially, but you were identifying patterns. You were also identifying areas with low density or high density. So here's a couple of examples. These are maps showing um, confirmed COVID cases across the world. Okay, And you can see in the first map with the red dots that there are uh, more clusters, say, in North America and Europe, but less clusters in Africa. Okay, You're seeing patterns high density and low density. You can also see those patterns, but projected a different way through chloropleth of um, COVID cases across the United States. For the darkest blue, that's where you're gonna have the highest density of COVID cases. And that's gonna be in the United States. You see a little bit in Spain as well. Okay. And going back to flows, another way we think spatially is the biggest way we've seen this in probably our class is migration routes, okay? We could take it to a really local level of flows that trips you make from your house to school every day or in a week or in a year, okay? And we can see this on a larger scale of, say, um, the migration routes from Iraq over here to different parts of the region, okay? So we see bigger uh, arrows going into Syria and Jordan, which indicates more people, I also use that map down at the bottom of remittances. And remember that is where um, migrants are sending most of their earned money uh, back to their home countries. And we can see that as also a flow map. Okay, another way we think spatially is through distance decay. Yay for distance decay. Okay, so this is simple too. Remember that distance decay is just the interaction between two places as the distance increases. So think about um, the example I used in class a lot, IKEA. So I am not willing to drive to get a cup of coffee. Um, to I don't want to go to Denver. I don't want to drive 90 minutes to get coffee. However, I might be willing to drive to Denver a couple of times to get new bedroom furniture, or a new couch for my house. Um, so the idea is that if you look at that graph down there, there's going to be more interaction between places if the distance is shorter and less interaction between places as the distance gets longer. Okay, last, time-space compression. This is another way that we think spatially. Now remember, time-space compression is a little bit opposite of the idea of distance decay in that it is increasing the sense of connectivity, um, bringing people and ideas closer together through technology and travel, even though that distance is staying the same. So I love that chart on the right because it shows how over time, as our technology gets better, it does bring us closer together. And I like using the example of Kim Kardashian there and Jay-Z on their jet plane because they have the technology and the money. It's no big deal for them to fly, say, from L.A. to New York City to go to an event because of this technology that we have today. Now this slide we did in class, so hopefully it jars your memory. I'm not gonna read all of it, but uh, a different kind of catch-all for spatial concepts. Remember that anytime we're spatial thinking, it's always about a location. That location can either be site or situation. Uh, yeah, I would know the difference between site and situation. Remember site is a specific place and a situation are how areas around that space are linked up. This is the last slide. We also did this in class. Uh, spatial thinking, as far as the bigger picture, remember, starts as a, at a location, site versus situation. And then that one through eight is just different ways that you can spatially think. Remember, four-level map analysis and looking at patterns and high densities and low densities. And that last part down there talks about how spatial thinking can also be very temporary. And probably the biggest thing we covered in that is just migration routes because those are constantly changing. That's another way to spatially think. All right, guys, that's it. Sorry it took so long. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. All right, love you guys. Bye.